In our modern world, we strive for a more progressive environment that diversifies our encounters and experiences. This includes the world of entertainment. Film has become a much more diverse place for those of many races and identities, although it can still use much work. There is one place in particular that needs a lot of help, and that's the representation of LGBT culture in American animated films. How is it that over a century since the rise of film, this is still an issue? Let's investigate. Between the 1890s and 1930s, homosexual men were portrayed on screen through stereotypical characteristics such as flamboyant and effeminate behavior. Pansies, they were called. Homosexual women, on the other hand, were portrayed through cross-dressing and working a man's job. When cinema attendance decreased during the Great Depression, filmmakers produced films with high shock value to put audience members in seats. One of these shocks was the inclusion of more homosexual characters. The American public began debating as to whether film had become too shocking. This is where the Motion Picture Production Code comes in. The production code was, at its core, a moral guideline put in place starting in 1930 to make sure films were appropriate enough so that Catholic and Protestant groups wouldn't boycott their films. One of the rules in the code put an end to overt pansy characters and established that all homosexual characters must fall under subtext. Due to the fact that homosexuality was considered a sexual perversion at the time, any film depictions of said subtle homosexuality usually resulted in the character being a villain, or a victim of circumstance where they ended up committing a crime anyway. Either way, the code stated they had to be punished by the end of the film, and so they were. But between the Stonewall Riots of 1969 and the AIDS pandemic of the 80s, LGBT representation started to become more tolerant and complex. By the mid-1990s, film reached an important movement of film called New Queer Cinema, with films like Paris is Burning and Poison. This was monumental in the development of LGBT representation in film. So at this point you might be asking, what does this have to do with the title topic, LGBT representation in American animated film? Don't worry, time to explain. Mentioned above in the code was how homosexual characters must fall under subtext and eventually fall under punishment. This led to the modern concept of queer coding, the idea where a character, typically a villain or antagonist in a film, TV show, or other type of medium, is given traits commonly associated with queer people but is not explicitly stated to be queer. In came Disney, the little animation studio that could. Simplifying it as much as I can, Disney Animation had a great couple of decades until it didn't. And when it crashed, it crashed hard. After the release of The Black Cauldron, Disney's rock bottom so to speak, there was a major restructuring in Disney Animation so as to regain their good graces with the public. A new era called the Disney Renaissance. Now there were a lot of factors that helped them achieve this, from the appointing of new management to the use of new animation techniques to the focus on new types of projects. But a major factor too could be argued was the idea of a compelling villain. Disney had some good villains in the past in the form of the evil queen, Maleficent, and Cruella de Vil, but most of their film antagonists besides them really lacked the same bite. So how did Disney give their new villains personality? by using one of the most tried and true methods of Hollywood villainy, the queer-coded villain. There's too much evidence to deny that it's there. The great mouse detective's Radigan moves delicately and with careful poise, frequently pulling out pink objects of his to use. The Little Mermaid's Ursula was so far as based on the drag queen Divine. Beauty and the Beast's LeFou was basically confirmed in the live-action remake. Jafar and Scar from Aladdin and the Lion King both display a sort of femininity both stereotypically associated with gay men. Pocahontas's Governor Ratcliffe is literally just a meme at this point. The Hunchback of Notre Dame's Frollo is less a representation of homosexuality and more just a show of repressed sexuality in general. And Hades from Hercules can't stop looking at and commenting about those abs. Some say the joke is he's literally flaming, but considering he's Hades, I'll let that slide. Is it purely coincidental that this strategy occurred at the same time as the new queer cinema period? Was Disney purposely using this tactic to maintain their contemporary pure family image? I couldn't tell you, and very few people probably could. 
It's a shame the world views Disney as the epoch for teaching our children important values about life, because in reality they are worlds behind. Whereas the people that truly broke the boundaries for LGBTQ plus people were... On August 13, 1997, a show by the name of South Park would premiere on Comedy Central, changing the landscape of animated comedy television forever, along with a few other shows of its time. Creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone's frequent use of taboo subjects in the show were frequently the target of controversy and outrage, and yet gained massive popularity. In comes the South Park movie in 1999, aptly titled Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Embracing its social position of the time, both negative and positive, the film makes use of its giant popularity to make a statement about censorship and the controversies they had caused over the past few years by putting as much controversial content they could into the film, including third graders swearing, being set on fire, and being sent to hell, among other things. Another big and controversial aspect of the film was homosexuality, and South Park was the first American animated theatrically released film to feature a confirmed on-screen homosexual character, and not only one, but three of them. The first is a character known as Big Gay Al, a stereotypical homosexual man characterized by his flamboyant behavior and tendencies. But he's not the most shocking of the film. That honor goes to Satan, who is in an abusive relationship with Saddam Hussein, and learns by the end to stand up for himself and throws him into hell. Whether these sets of representation are appropriate or not, there's no denying that they were bold and at least bothered to clearly show the relationship on screen, which wouldn't be done again by a major studio for many years. There would be a few made-for-TV films that toyed with the idea of LGBT representation on screen, including Daria's Is It Fall Yet? and Futurama's Beast with a Billion Backs. But the next truly theatrical animated American homosexual character wouldn't appear until 2012 in the form of Paranorman. Paranorman was a more family-oriented film, and definitely took a more subtle and less overblown approach to having a homosexual character than South Park. It is worth noting that Paranorman is the first original property to follow in South Park's footsteps. Whereas previous attempts such as South Park, Daria, and Futurama were all following their respective television series and had a lot more clout and room for error, Paranorman was risking a lot, using its first chance to get it right. Of course, animated television has a lot more LGBT representation and diversity in general, but that's another conversation entirely, one that I hope to have one day. A lot of this probably has to do with the fact that television has lots of episodes and time to ease the audience into their characters, and is able to work with harder topics, whereas whatever you put in your two-hour film is all you get, making more controversial topics less accessible. Regardless, Paranorman still caused some ruckus concerning its content. Even so, this was all it took to get big studios committed to riding the representation train, without fully committing, of course, because who wants that? Frozen inspired conspiracy theories that Elsa was lesbian because of Let It Go's apparently provocative lyrics. It also sparked theories that Oaken was gay based on the menial evidence that there was a man in the sauna with his family. How to Train Your Dragon 2's Gobber the Belch has one line that mentions a lack of marriage, which had to be confirmed outside of the film by the voice actor and director that this was referring to his sexuality. Zootopia features a three-second shot of a kudu and oryx who could only be assumed to be a same-sex couple due to their hyphenated names in the credits and the confirmation by the director. Storks devotes the same amount of time to about two or three same-sex couples when the birds are delivering babies in one of the last sequences of the films. And Finding Dory with a pair of women in the park who everyone so badly wanted to be Disney's first lesbian couple until co-director Andrew Stanton said, they can be whatever you want them to be. So here we are, in the 21st century, at the very apex of the gay rights movement, with an entire industry absolutely petrified to pull the trigger on what could be the best move for them yet. And out of all these people, all these supposedly progressive, family-friendly studios, who's the one that truly breaks ground next? Once you go taco, you never go back -o. 
Of these past theatrically released animated American films that we've looked at, only two have made even some sort of fair LGBT impression, South Park and Paranorman. And sorry Paranorman, but South Park at least had the boldness and confidence to portray the actual relationship on screen. Another highly controversial, sex-positive, language-infused, violent, vulgar, R-rated, aimed at the masses animated film wouldn't come out until 2016 in the form of Sausage Party. Now, Sausage Party is not without fault, especially in the form of the alleged poor working conditions of the animators and the preceding 36 animators that were blacklisted because of their complaints. However, it stands to be said that this film has more confirmed on-screen LGBT interactions than the past five films combined. This leads to the question, as progressive as our modern world likes to pretend it is, why does it seem the only way we get a reaction out of the American film industry is in the form of sensationalism? Why did Satan have to date Saddam Hussein? Why is a taco having sex with a hot dog bun? Why is Leica, a studio of under 400 employees, more confident in their use of LGBT characters than Disney and DreamWorks, studios of 800 and 2700 employees respectively? The world may never know. The important fact is that there are movies made by the little guys out there unafraid to represent as many people as they can, as sensationalized as it may be. Maybe one day we'll get a normal American animated film with a normal representation of a normal LGBT relationship. It seems like other countries are able to do it just fine. It seems like television is able to do it just fine. What's missing? That's the question, and it's time to look for the answer.